record. No. Okay, I think it's recording now. Just a very brief recap. I was talking about the previous course on creation and evolution that we're looking at the origin of human life phylogenetically, in other words, as a group. Okay, and now this course will look at the origin of human life ontogenetically. <coughs> So we had uh, the origin of human life, bless you. Phylogenetically means it picks up from phylum or group in general, okay? So the origin of the group of the human species of Homo sapiens as a whole. But now we're gonna look at the origin of human life ontogenetically. Ontos is being, is being in uh, okay, Greek or Latin, but it means the origin of the individual, of each one of us individually, the seven billion that we are on earth, okay? So the question, the key question for this course is, when do I begin? When do each individual human being begins as an individual? So going back to our uh, presentation here, we're going to establish the biological facts first. I'm proposing that we begin at fertilization, which is the biological term. In non-biological terms, people talk about conception, all right? But more scientifically, it's fertilization. Existentially, it's the same event. It's just with different terminology. We're going to start then by reviewing uh, reproduction, how it happens in nature, how reproduction happens in nature, how a new individual comes about in nature, okay? Whether we believe it or not, whether we like it or not, whether we observe it or not, this is what has been observed, in fact, universally over the years and decades and centuries of how a new individual arises in nature from a previous individual of the same species. And to do that, we're going to have to get uh, fairly, uh, fairly deep down, okay, at least the basics of DNA, because DNA is the information molecule, it's the molecule of inheritance. It's like a package, it's a code that passes on the necessary information so that the new individual is in fact of the same species as the parent. All right, whoever that parent is, whatever the species is. And this is a, we'll call it a universal phenomenon. In other words, whenever we observe a species, whenever we uh, scientists discover a new species, guess what? DNA is at the origin of that individual. DNA is the universal uh, molecule of information of inheritance. Now, uh, typically courses are, and programs are uh, broad or deep, and it's a question of finding a balance, right? If we try to uh, make a program very broad, extremely broad, it cannot be too deep. But if we make it very deep, uh, like a specialty and specialize, then it's not gonna be too broad. I'm trying to strike a balance here, all right? Try to be as broad as possible with the program, but at the same time, the depth that is necessary on which to have a solid foundation, especially to present our case, let's say, I'm always assuming a secular environment. In other words, that our listeners, when we go out and talk about bioethics and try to, to present our arguments, uh, essentially I'm thinking will be a, a secular um, environment, a secular culture that uh, hopefully uh, would uh, be interested about the facts. The one difficulty that I have, and I'll tell you always is a struggle, is when ideology kicks in. And then there's no arguing, because ideology has no, no reasoning, all right? It's just based on a preconceived notion, and everything is then colored according to that particular ideology or agenda, 
that I'm trying to promote, that I believe in, whatever the agenda is, and then everything is colored around that, regardless of whether the, it matches the facts or not. <laughs> okay, so that's what I've always find to be the challenge when trying to speak with people who are coming out of an ideological camp, and basically there's very little to no dialogue possible. Okay, so that's why I'm always basing this on nature, right? Because nature happens whether we exist or not. <laughs> All right, enough of my ideology. <laughs> Two modes of reproduction. Again, if you have questions or comments, stop me and, and jump right in, okay? When we observe nature, when we look out this window and we look at the rest of the uh, ecosystem, we notice that there are two modes of reproduction in nature. We notice that individuals arise, right? in life, organic life. When I talk about life at this stage, I'm talking about organic life, the two million species that have been classified and the approximate 10 to 20 million other species that have not been discovered yet. What if, at least from the ones that have been discovered universally, they either reproduce sexually or asexually, or sometimes they have the capacity for both, for reproducing sexually and asexually, all right? That happens a lot in plants, but also in some animals. So let's go a little further. For now, let's stick with asexual reproduction. There are many different types or examples of asexual reproduction, okay? Examples. So starting with uh, what is known as binary fission. And in general, these are gonna go from small to large physically. Mm -hmm. Binary fission is mostly microscopic organisms, for example, bacteria. So you know that fusion is coming together. So fission is division, all right? Fission is division and binary means splitting two basically. When we translate binary fission into normal English, it means splitting into two, from one to two, all right? So here is a micro photograph of bacteria. Here is a single bacterium. And here you see this bacterium is splitting into two. This one is further along. This one is almost complete, right? So these are examples of bacteria of the same type hmm, that are splitting into two, and this is called binary fission. They elongate and they split in the middle, all right? I will anticipate you that basically what is happening here, why cells have to split, is an issue of a volume to surface ratio problem. It's a problem of volume to surface ratio. And we'll look at that. It's a very interesting thing, but it's a very mechanical, physical thing of why cells, as they grow, they need to split into two. So this is a, a simplest uh, type of asexual reproduction. In other words, non-sexual, doesn't involve gametes, does not involve reproductive cells. Uh, uh, in, um, uh, protozoans, protozoans which are microscopic uh, organisms that have a true nucleus, so they're eukaryotes, okay, they have a true nucleus. Amoeba, for example, is starting to split here. You can see the sequence uh, within 20 minutes. It will start splitting in the middle. Mm -hmm. And as it does, it, it, it expands also, and then it splits. You know, the amoeba doesn't have any particular shape. It has these uh, projections. And eventually it splits down the middle, more or less, and two amoebae come out of one single uh, amoeba on an average of 20 minutes. And that's about the average under ideal conditions that the cells normally split, uh, at least uh, uh, at the bacterial level. Uh, the average is any 20 min every 20 minutes, there's a duplication of the population of bacteria and protozoans under ideal conditions, that they have ideal nutrients and temperature and so forth. Other protozoans are paramecium. So one paramecium, several paramecia. Remember one of the side uh, benefits of this program is that you'll learn a little Latin and Greek on the way. Uh, here's a single paramecium. Here's one splitting, splitting, okay, in different stages, but basically they duplicate. Maybe this one is beginning to split, but it's showing 
uh, paramecium that are split. And these are, by the way, these are all photographs. These are macro photographs. Okay. So you can see how the split happens. This is a good moment to point out that the paramecium has the one nucleus, actually it has a little, little tiny micronucleus, but we'll focus on the big one, the macronucleus. The, the nucleus also has to split, has to duplicate before the full splitting occurs. So that's one uh, technical issue, if you will, for cells as they split, right, from one to two, the nucleus also has to duplicate. And what I mean by the nucleus is actually the content of the nucleus, which is going to be by and large DNA. So the DNA has to duplicate on the original parent cell in order for the split to happen. So the DNA has to duplicate first so as to end up with an individual nucleus of the same type, of the same species, once the two daughter cells are fully split, okay? So I'm giving you a little anticipation there of DNA duplication, which officially is called replication, and we're gonna look at that. Another example is called budding or budding off. It happens in what we call lower animals, salenterates <laughs> and periphery. The periphery are the uh, sponges. Salenterates are hydras, anemones, jellyfish. Okay. You notice here's a hydra with its tentacles. It's a type of, uh, kind of an anemone. And here's a little budding off of a new hydra. Eventually, this uh, daughter hydra will uh, sever here and become a new hydra in its own right. It's already a new individual, but it's still attached, all right? So hydras, salentrates uh, can reproduce asexually by budding. It also happens in uh, yeast. Okay. So here is a, a yeast cell, which is also eukaryotic. It has a, a nucleus, single cell, and here's the little bud coming off. Here's a scar of another bud. And in fact, this one bud that is budding is actually a bud of this older one. You can see it here. And this older cell has another scar and another scar. So there were two previous buds coming out of this one. Here's one in the process of budding, more developed. Here's just beginning to bud, all right, etc. But that's how yeast splits. Uh, these little buds that grow out and then eventually uh, sever and become independent. And that is uh, another type of asexual reproduction. Moving forward, vegetative propagation. This happens a lot in plants uh, because in, in general, asexual reproduction is less energy investment than sexual because in sexual reproduction, uh, gametes have to be developed and that takes energy and is considered that sexual reproduction energetically uh, costs about twice as much for the individual, for the two individuals. It costs twice as much on average for individuals to reproduce sexually as opposed to asexual. So there is an economy involved in asexual reproduction and that's why there's so many different types. It's also considered to be older, uh, evolutionarily speaking, than sexual reproduction. So continuing, uh, vegetative propagation happens, like I say, a lot in plants and not only grasses. Uh, as you can see here, these uh, little shoots that come out. If you ever pick up a tuft of graf grass from the lawn and you pull it, you'll see that a whole string of tufts come out, right? Okay, those are all clones in effect. It's asexual reproduction is the same genetic material is being passed on. And therefore, these are essentially clones. These tufts of grass are clones of the original one, and they keep uh, developing that way. This is the general way. This little uh, shoot goes into the ground, and there are a lot of um, stem cells, if you will, that develop the root and then the shoot system, and then your little plant develops from there. Once this little plant becomes established, this stalk can be cut and um, it's not really an umbilical cord in the sense that it doesn't provide uh, nourishment. It just provides a little stem region that has active growth. 
Okay, so vegetative propagation happens also in larger plants like uh, trees, aspen, for example, a whole forest of aspen can, come, can have developed from a single aspen tree underground that is putting out these uh, shoots and then from the shoots other uh, new trees come out. So grasses, bushes, and even some trees reproduce asexually very successfully. What about mangroves? Mangrove, mangrove uh, sometimes they do. But what you're seeing is mostly the uh, root system, right, that is growing above ground, so they have these uh, semi aerial roots and then go into the salt water. But the typical reproduction for mangrove is sexual, and those are the brown pods that are floating around, yeah. all right, and eventually they come to shore, some of them, and they become established. So those large brown pods, that is actually the seed pod. And if there's a seed, there has to be fertilization uh, beforehand. The banana, the banana is a good example. Banana, yes. Is that a good example? Yes, yes. So banana is actually is a very luxurious, uh, um, uh, it's a monocot grass, just like uh, sugarcane. It's a very luxurious uh, grass, if you will. Okay, but they, yes, they're very effective this way. They also put out little buds on the side, yeah. little babies, like bromeliads, like orchids. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's all asexual orchids. reproduction. Yeah, very successful. Uh, another type is called sporogenesis, sporogenesis, where spores through mitosis become uh, new individuals, okay? It's a process of mitosis, which is cell division. And this happens in uh, fungi, it happens in mosses and ferns, what we call the lower uh, vascular plants. So that's a sporogenesis, starting with a spore, which through mitosis will develop into uh, a, new, um, a new individual. In examples in animals, little higher animals, uh, well, we have uh, planarians are actually uh, flat worms. They're in the group of the flat worms, the platyhelminthes, okay? And planaria, you can cut into several sections and each section will grow into a new individual. So they have a lot of regeneration power. Basically, uh, they have stem cells or the equivalents of stem cells throughout their bodies so that if they're cut into sections and the environment is conducive, right? It has a good nutritional uh, medium and the proper temperature and everything else, each section will actually grow into a new individual, totally asexually. Hmm? Also happens with uh, starfish, for example, when one or more legs are cut off, new legs will be regenerated. Not only that, the leg that was cut off will also regenerate the other missing legs, okay? As long as this uh, severed leg, the severed leg, as long as the severed leg has a little piece of what is called the central disc, the central disc is basically this area, the juncture of the legs and the center here, that's called the central disc. As long as it has some section of the central disc, that severed leg will actually grow other new legs into a new individual, okay? Now, what happens here in regeneration is not 100%, it's not complete so that uh, forever this starfish will look kind of awkward, will have one big leg and some shorter legs. So you can tell that this was the severed part. And the other starfish, it happens in some species, other species of starfish have a more complete regeneration. But typically you can tell the section that was severed or that was cut because the regeneration is not as full. It also happens with many lizards, for example, with their tail, right? But typically the regrown tail doesn't get as long as the original tail, right? So there's some regenerative power, some stem cells, but they don't go 100%. However, unlike the tail of the lizard, this starfish is actually a new starfish. It's a new individual, okay? All right, so that's called uh, fragmentation and regeneration, typically for animals. Uh, also, one that is very interesting and it will be relevant for us in bioethical issues at the beginning of human life is clones 
All of these are really examples of clone one way or another in the sense that the new generation is identical, genetically speaking, from the parents, okay, because they come from one parent and it's the parent's DNA that has been developed into the new individual. But this one is interesting in that uh, mammals and particularly humans, there is this capacity within the first couple of weeks of embryonic development to split the one zygote or the one morula to split into two or more. And these eventually will form what we call identical twins. Okay, not fraternal twins, but identical twins. Scientifically, identical twins are called monozygotic or monozygous twins. Mono meaning that they come from a single zygote. Okay, so these are monozygotic twins, which necessarily have to be of the same sex, either they're both girls or both boys. They can have, they can either share a placenta or have se a separate placenta, depending on when, within those first two weeks of window, when the split happens. If the split happens early, typically at the moral stage, they'll have two individual placentas because you have two blastocysts that are implant. Don't worry about the terms now, we'll cover them in a couple of weeks, <laughs> in a couple of, yeah, a couple of lectures. But if the split happens a little later at the blastocyst stage, they'll have a single placenta, but there'll be two individuals because you have two inner cell masses developed. And this okay. depends on development. Sorry? This is dependent, depends on the development. It's not really known exactly what causes twinning, uh, monozygotic twinning, okay? Yeah. It's not really known exactly, but uh, it's a type of asexual reproduction very early on it's a possibility of seeing it as an asexual reproduction, especially if we maintain that the zygote is a new individual, that zygote within the first two weeks has split into two individuals that have their independence. And uh, I don't know if you know identical twins personally, I know some identical twins. Uh, each individual twin is a human being, right? It's not half a being. And they have therefore a soul and everything and they function and, as individual human beings. Okay, but that happened very early on. Typically, the window is from the first couple of weeks. It's actually kind of a large window, <laughs> 14 days more or less, from fertilization, even into implantation. It can even happen in early implantation, okay, which in the human happens about five to seven days after fertilization, more or less, implantation. We'll, we'll get into detail about all these things, but for now, this is a type of um, a natural clone that happens without human intervention, okay? I think in, in the US, the, 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 um, I saw a statistic one time when, when I was doing my first PhD at, uh, in Rome, it's one every 64 uh, pregnancies, uh, more or less, is an identical twin, which is a rather high uh, statistic. One in every 64, more or less, uh, pregnancies in the US is identical twins. Now, fraternal twins, dizygotic, they're called dizygotic twins, okay? Like the word says, they come from two zygotes. So how do we get two zygotes? Well, we start with two eggs that are fertilized by two sperm. Remember, there are millions of sperm around, so any egg that is around on, on average is gonna get fertilized, okay? But in that case of dizygotic twins, that woman in her cycle at that, at that time has actually matured two, two eggs simultaneously and they both got fertilized, okay? And so those are dizygotic twins, and that's why dizygotic twins or uh, fraternal twins can be boy, girl, can be different uh, sex because they come from two different sperm, which are the ones that determine the, the sex, okay? Okay, we're gonna get into a little more detail about that, but for now I'm presenting it as natural clones, another example of asexual reproduction. Right. Michaela, John, I just wonder if you uh, have any idea which is more common, separate placentas or shared? I don't, actually, but uh, if people want to look it up, maybe yeah. you can tell me. But right. the next couple of uh, lectures, we're going to get into more detail about this. Okay. This is considered <laughs> It can be, but uh, it can be. So um, it could be a phenomenon. I mean, how else could you, biologically, it fits within the pattern of asexual reproduction. But they are not clones of their parents. They are... Exactly. So it stands on the basis that the zygote is a new individual. And that zygote is undergoing uh, splitting 
very early on. There are implications about that and there are complexities that we need to solve, but I'm going to use that uh, argument a little later on when we come into the bioethical analysis of the beginning of human life, okay? So you can bracket it for now if in fact it is a sexual reproduction or not, okay? But I'll present what I consider arguments uh, for your consideration that it is a type of asexual reproduction early on. The implication is that we humans and maybe other mammals uh, have the capacity for asexual reproduction. As long as it's very, very early, we have a window actually of two weeks within our lifetime. And then that window closes. Okay, it's got implications, right? All right. Uh, another type is called parthenogenesis. This is actually a separate mechanism and it happens in, typically in reptiles, some, some lizards and some snakes, and uh, some sharks, okay? It's been documented, a number of uh, lower vertebrates, what we call the lower vertebrates, the fish and the uh, reptiles. Here, the egg first becomes diploid, all right? So the nucleus doubles, the DNA doubles in the nucleus, and then there's some kind of stimulus, which here is shown by a charge because this can be done in the lab. So we can do parthenogenesis in the lab with an electrical stimulus of an egg. In fact, uh, these experiments way, go way back to the beginning of last century. I don't know, Hans Spamin, if that name sounds familiar to you, Spamin. It's historical now, but Spamin, I think it's double N, it, from Germany, he took frog eggs, unfertilized frog eggs, and would prick them with uh, uh, a needle or something equivalent to a needle, and those eggs would start development. They would be haploid because there was no fertilization, but uh, undergo normal development, and little baby frogs develop from there. Well, you get the tadpoles first and so forth, but they, they, and they were haploid. In other words, they did not, and there was uh, no fertilization going on. So. In these lower vertebrates, apparently, some stimulus, which here is presented as a charge, an electrical charge, can get that egg to develop into an individual. Uh, but typically, in nature, the charge, the, the stimulus is not necessarily an electrical charge, okay, it's mostly a chemical uh, stimulus, some kind of a chemical hormonal stimulus. But these species, uh, the whip tail uh, lizard, and the Brahani, this is called the Brahani snake, uh, which is actually kind of um, mm. blind because it lives on the ground all the time. I found one here <laughs> one day uh, last year, little one. And some sharks, they have this capacity to undergo parthenogenesis naturally, okay? And it's some kind of a biochemical uh, stimulus that gets that egg to, uh, either remain haploid or go diploid and develop new uh, siblings. Okay, and finally, just mitosis as a whole is a type of asexual reproduction at the cellular level because it's a splitting of the cells, a duplicating of the cell, and the two daughter cells have the essentially identical genetic material as the parent cell, uh, the mother cell from which uh, those two daughter cells came. So here is, again, an electromicrograph. This is a photograph of cells uh, undergoing uh, mitosis at different stages of development. Uh, the the uh, nucleus, as you can see, has been stained, actually the DNA. And so you can see the different stages of mitosis. Mm, for example, this is a full cell in inter interface, and that little dark dot probably is the RNA. Uh, or the nucleolus, but uh, here's a cell in interface where you cannot see distinct chromosomes, but rather chromatin, which we'll talk about in a minute. But then when the cell is about to duplicate, to reproduce, to undergo mitosis, the distinct chromosomes start forming. In other words, the chromatin starts condensing even further into distinct little bodies that are called chromosomes. Uh, mention the word further in a minute and then they line up at the equator, the chromosomes do, the nuclear membrane disappears, uh, is dissolved, and the, 
the chromosomes line up at the equator of the cell, and then they migrate to either pole, which here is shown horizontally, sideways, they continue migrating uh, until they reach the end, uh, the two poles proper, okay? And then they start re-aggregating into two distinct nuclei, uh, little lamina forms in the middle, little division between the two uh, cells until eventually uh, there are two distinct daughter cells, okay? So this is kind of an overview of uh, mitosis, which is normal cell division, okay? And remember, there's cells, so cells are dividing all the time in our body, trillions of cells are dividing and all cells are dying. So we got mitosis, your ptosis, and everybody's ptosis is undergoing mitosis, okay? Now, why does a cell split <laughs> to begin with? I mentioned that is a volume to surface ratio issue. Okay, so this is uh, not necessarily a photograph, this is a diagram that is showing a cell with a nucleus represented this dark brown ball here, all right? And what happens is that the cell is growing. As the cell is metabolizing uh, and uh, living, the cell is naturally growing, it's accumulating more uh, water is also accumulating more substances, nourishment, and also proteins that are produced and other macromolecules within the cell. So cells naturally grow as they develop, okay? They can also specialize as they grow and differentiate. But the point is that the cell is growing. Now think about it. Physically, right? The cell will have a volume inside, and I forgot to bring a balloon, but then there is the surface of the cell. So the inside of the cell is how many dimensions? The volume. By definition, a volume has how many dimensions? Three dimensions, right? It's three-dimensional. Definition, volume is three-dimensional. Just like this room has a height, a depth, and a width, all right? And so our bodies and down to the cellular level. But the surface of the cell, the surface of the cell, which would be equivalent to the paint of the walls of this room. How many dimensions is that? It's two dimensions. Even though the surface is curved, all right, it's a sphere, but we're looking at the periphery, so that's two dimensions. That's two dimensions. And we could theoretically flatten out that surface on a projection, okay, and get the equivalent surface area of the surface that is around what we call the cell membrane. Okay, as the cell is growing, the volume is growing, so the volume will duplicate, right? Let's say that the surface is also duplicating, but you notice that the volume, as the volume duplicates, it occupies more space than the surface. If the surface duplicates, it doesn't keep up with the size of the volume. And so what happens, very much like a balloon, uh, the, the membrane is, stretches out someone, all right? When we blow into a balloon, that surface, the balloon itself, the membrane stretches out but to a point. There's a point that it cannot stretch out anymore. If we continue to put volume into that balloon, water, air, whatever, it's gonna burst, okay? Because it's again the issue that the volume grows larger, if you will, than surface per cycle. And so what happens? When the cell splits into two, what happens to the volume? The volume is halved in each daughter cell. The surface is also halved in each daughter cell, okay? But the ratio, the ratio between volume to surface favors the surface because now the volume is smaller proportionally to the larger original volume. So whenever a cell splits, what happens is that that favors the surface ratio contrasted to the volume ratio. In other words, more volume is lost, if you will, when splitting than surface is lost, okay? So it's simply, it's really a mathematical, mechanical mathematical thing. 
And that's why cells need to split. And when they do, they favor, they revert the process, if you will, of disfavoring the surface uh, ratio into refavoring it, if you will. Okay? So now the two, there will be two, but there's a duplication. Okay? And each daughter cell can then continue on with the same process. So ideally, there, this splitting can go on indefinitely. Okay? Ideally, as long as there's no mutation and so forth, and that is, in fact, mm, uh, uh, stem cells and cell lines, what are called cell lines in the lab, okay, they're called, they have been immortalized, is that they continue to grow under ideal conditions in the lab and continue to duplicate and duplicate, and they form what is known as confluence. In other words, they cover the whole petri dish, when they get to a certain level of confluence, they have to be, they have to be seeded onto a new petri dish or two, two new petri dishes, otherwise they'll overflow, okay? And uh, that's called passage and so forth, and that's how cell lines are maintained in the lab. Hopefully, the idea is to uh, develop enough cell lines to cure and heal the different organ systems of the body, okay? So that's all involved in what is known as stem cell research, which we'll get into. There's adult stem cells and there's embryonic stem cells, and they are uh, distinct. They make a big difference, uh, bioethically speaking. But that's toward the uh, uh, latter part of the course. So we see that basically cells have to split because of growth, normal growth, and the fact that there comes a point where the surface cannot handle that body. And by splitting, then it favors, again, the surface versus uh, the volume uh, ratio. Moving forward then, we're going to get now into uh, the DNA itself. Uh, it's about 10.30, so I'm thinking this would be a good time to stop because now I'm going to go straight uh, for the next uh, couple hours, more or less, uh, into DNA itself. Okay, so we're going to look at the DNA, just to set the stage, we start with a cell, and within the cell, which is already microscopic, there is the nucleus, and within the nucleus, there are the chromosomes, so the DNA material, and the chromosomes are made up of DNA. All right, and we're gonna get into this DNA molecule a bit more in detail, how it holds the information, what we call the genetic code. In other words, all the parts of our body and all the functions of our body are contained in this DNA molecule, okay, which is amazing, which will be super concentrated in an egg and a sperm so that that can be passed on to the next generation. I mean, it's just amazing the elegance of this design, of this issue, this invention, if you will, of sexual reproduction, right? And asexual also, because it also happens in asexual reproduction. But we're going to get into that, how this information is encoded into the DNA and how it's also transmitted and passed on. Okay, questions or comments now? People are good. Let's uh, take a break for a few minutes and then we'll come back into this, yeah? Okay. So, let's see, hopefully this was well, recorded. Yes. Give us uh, our schedule for this semester. Okay, so welcome back. We'll continue now with uh, the second section and I want to delve uh, more deeply into DNA as the information molecule of inheritance, the one that as we say has the genetic code to pass all of the information necessary in this super compressed package, super synthetic package on to the new generation so that the next individual comes out precisely as the same species as the parents, whether the parents are a single parent in the case of asexual reproduction or two parents in the case of sexual reproduction. So let's go on. DNA itself appears in two shapes or types, of, okay? It will be either as chromatin or as distinct chromosomes. Most of the time, most DNA is in chromatin form even though this term doesn't come up typically in undergraduate uh, studies, 
but it's important to understand that most of the time, mole cells are actually in interphase. They're interphase. Mole cells in the body, most of the time, are not reproducing. They are metabolizing. They're doing their function. Okay, so if it's a liver cell, a brain cell, a red blood cell, actually mature red blood cells don't have a nucleus, uh, but any cell of the body that is functioning normally, right, within the tissues, within the organs that uh, they form, those cells are in interphase, meaning that those cells are metabolizing, they're doing a function, and therefore they're not reproducing. They're not duplicating, they're not undergoing mitosis, or meiosis. And so chromatin is one single long molecule of DNA, which has been very easily defined as a wad of spaghetti, <laughs> like a wad of spaghetti inside a bowl, all right, where there's a single spaghetti. <laughs> you can pull it out and you have one long spaghetti inside the bowl, which would be the nucleus. That's called chromatin and it is the DNA molecule that is condensed within itself, is coiled within itself. If we were to pull out this DNA molecule, this chromatin, from any one of our nuclei, all right, from any cell in the body, and stretch it out here like this, it will stretch out to about how long do you think? Yes, six feet, about two meters, all right, which is, that's three uh, feet, right? Uh, approximately one arm length and one body length is about three feet more or less, it's about a yard. Oh, here we go, there's a yard. <laughs> Look at that, okay. So an easy measure, that's one, uh, that's three feet or one meter approximately. So two of these, all right. <laughs> you stretch out there, one single molecule of DNA from every single nucleus in our body. <clears throat> Amazing. So it is super compacted. We say that it is compacted, all right? It's coiled upon itself many, many fold, many, many times. It's like taking a rubber band and twisting it and twisting it, you know how it bunches up, all right? Okay. Now, when, and that's during interface. When the cell undergoes reproduction, it stops most of its metabolism because it goes now into reproductive mode. That's called the cell cycle. When the cell goes into reproductive mode, it slows down every other metabolism, every other function, and just concentrates in the function of reproduction, of splitting, okay? When that happens, this chromatin condenses even further into distinct packages, distinct little bodies that are called chromosomes. And that's precisely where the word comes from, when these little distinct bodies were being seen under the microscope, like I showed you here with a stain, because these are stained, when these little distinct bodies were seen, like for example here, all right, uh, they are distinct little bodies. They look like uh, colored little bodies. Because what happens, you know, the cell is pretty transparent. If we were to, if this, tissue here, which could be like the skin of an onion or something like that, which is a single cell layer, all right? And these are obviously plant cells. You know that because they're square like this. So in addition to having a cell membrane, they also have a cell wall, which is like a shoe box. You put a balloon inside a shoe box. Well, the shoe box itself is a cell wall. And that's typical of plant cells, right? That's all cellulose. That's what gives rigidity and structure to plants, even to tall trees. At any rate, Without staining, right, without staining, cells are pretty much transparent. So if you look at them under the microscope, you see nothing, you, you see through them. Mm -hmm. That's because the organelles are tiny, microscopic, super microscopic, and, uh, uh, but when, when the cell is splitting, you can see a little bit of a diffraction because these chromosomes are so condensed that they actually diffract the light a little bit, all right? And so there's a little bit of a, a shadow that can be seen without staining. A little bit of a shadow with a fairly large power microscope, you can see some shading, and that's the chromo reference of chromosome, trying to give you the origin of the word. So chromo is a reference to some 
uh, color. Mm -hmm. And SOM, of course, SOM is body. SOMA mm -hmm, is a body, uh, I think it's Greek. So these are little colored bodies. And they were uh, detected under the microscope in cells that were reproducing without staining. They were little shadows of little distinct bodies and that's where the word chromosome comes from. But they are super, super condensed and we're going to look at that condensation and why that condensation is important. But the interesting thing is that they condense into distinct bodies and typically they're paired. So you hear about chromosome pairs. They come in pairs is a default uh, safety mechanism to have a duplicate of the chromosomes normally. So for example, you hear the chromosome number for humans, 46 chromosomes or actually 23 pairs, 23 pairs. So we have a duplicate in every cell of our bodies, okay? But that's when the cell is reproducing. When the cell is not reproducing, these distinct bodies are not distinguishable. It's just one wad of DNA into a single ball. Excuse yeah. me. How do you get from the chromatin to the condensed chromosome again? Exactly. We're going to go there. How this happens, how this chromatin becomes distinct chromosomes. Yeah. It's, a very, it's a very detailed, elaborate process, but essentially that one spaghetti is cut up into 46 distinct sections, and those 46 spaghettis then coil even further, more compact, to form the 46 distinct chromosomes. And it's a process called replication. We're going to look at it uh, in some level of detail. Okay, so let's go forward. The interesting thing about this, though, is that it happens universally. For all, again, for all plants and animals that reproduce uh, sexually, this happens uh, universally. Okay? Even in asexual reproduction, because for mitosis, there has to be a duplication of the DNA first. All right, let's get into the DNA itself. Remember this general pattern here from cells. Within the cell is the nucleus. Within the nucleus is the chromosomes or the chromatin, but that chromatin is actually formed of this DNA, which you have seen so many times all over the place, what is called the double helix, all right? This double helix or the twisted ladder. All right, so why is it a helix? Because it's coiled. And it's double because it has two rails, if you will. So you can consider the simple example of a ladder. And if you twist it in opposite directions at the two ends of the ladder, you get a twisted ladder. Okay? So in science, we like to use sophisticated terms. So instead of twisting ladder, we call a double helix. Helix reference to the coil, to the first level of turn or spin, if you will and double because that ladder has actually two rails. Okay, these are diagrams. These are diagrams. We can go further into the detail of the diagram. Actually, this double helix is made up of atoms, many atoms, billions of atoms, because to get two feet worth of, I mean, to get two meters worth of atoms, one next to the other, okay, and molecules, you need millions and millions and millions of atoms to do that. But it's done, okay? So the basic molecules, the basic molecules that make up DNA are four, and they're called bases, okay? So a base is the basic unit, if you will, of DNA, and that's really where the information is stored in the sequence of these bases. And these are four bases, all right? They're also known as nucleotides chemically, so this is getting a little bit into the chemistry of it, they're called nucleotides. Adenine, guanine, thymine, and cytosine. And they're abbreviated just with their first letters, A, G, T, C, all right? Remember, I will also send you this PowerPoint uh, at the end of the lecture together with the link itself, so you'll have this uh, for reference. <coughs> so these bases are represented with the letters, these nucleotides, and you can see them here, T, A, A, T, C, G, etc. Okay, this is really originally high school biology, which 
hopefully was reinforced in college sometime, and I'm reinforcing it again. <laughs> now, again, we use the first letter, ATCG, for each one of the four bases or nucleotides, and they always come in pairs. They're paired up. For DNA, they're paired up, and there's a reason for that. We'll see why. Easy way to remember is you see how A are all straight lines to make the A and T also straight lines, right? Whereas C and G are curved. So G and G pair up, the curved pair up, and the straight lines pair up. So A with T and C with G. Those are the natural standard pairing up that occurs in uh, nature. In all DNA, universally, wherever we are on the planet. All right, part of the reason is because uh, one of these pairs is two hydrogen bonds and the other one is three hydrogen bonds that pair them and that's why they don't mismatch because uh, two hydrogen bonds will not match with three and the three will not match with two. So two and two and three and three hydrogen bonds is what keeps the two pairs in that sequence. Beyond that, some of these are single rings or some are double rings, but you notice that, for example, here, T and A, uh, A is a little longer than T, right? That's because A, adenine, is a double ring. Um, didn't really want to get too elaborate into the chemical structure, but since we're there, the picture is worth a thousand, thousand words, so let's go here for a moment and look at uh, the uh, nucleotides. So you see the chemical structure briefly. I'm not calling you responsible for this, but basically you can see how they are single and double. Can we make this bigger? Maybe this way. Yeah. Okay, you see adenine here, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. Two different levels of detail. Remember I mentioned the hydrogen bonding here. A and T have two hydrogen bonds, right? Whereas C and G have three hydrogen bonds. That's the, that's the link between the, the pairing. That's the base pairing. Beyond that, you see that adenine has two ring, <coughs> what we call nitrogen rings, or nitrogenous ring, rings. Here's a nitrogen ring, C, N for nitrogen. Here's a nitrogen ring. So this is a double ring. How about thymine? Single ring. It's a single ring. All right, it's got nitrogen, nitrogen. When, when there's no element indicated, what is the default? When there's no element indicating, the default is carbon, right? So there's a carbon there. All right, so thymine is a single ring, adenine is a double ring. The same down here, if one is single, the other one is double. In this case, cytosine is a single ring and guanine is a double ring. Why is that? Well, that is because the <coughs> railings, the two railings are parallel. They're parallel, which means that there has to be an equal distance. This is at the molecular level, this is at the atomic level. Okay, so we're getting super tiny here, very precise, and the railings have to be parallel throughout the entire DNA, throughout the entire six feet. And the, the only way to keep those railings parallel if there's gonna be two rings on one side, there has to be only one ring on the other side. Because if I put another two rings here, what's gonna do on that railing? It's gonna bulge out like this, okay? And that's actually a mutation, <laughs> okay? And if I use single rings on both uh, pairs, then it's going to wedge in like an hourglass, the railing, all right? So it's a very mechanical, very precise mechanical thing. In order to keep the two rails, in other words, the the phosphate groups or the sugars, these are sugars, the pentose, parallel to each other is to have three rings total in the middle for the, uh, for the rungs, for the steps of the ladder. And that can be in two combinations, either using uh, A with T or C with G. But A cannot go with G and T cannot go with C or vice versa, right? All right, so that's the whole deal about the basically the molecular structure of DNA. Whoops. Back to where you were. Thank you. And 
I was showing you that here. This is really down to the molecular and really in the atomic level because we can put elements in each one of these uh, corners. And this is really the, uh, the basic atomic structure of DNA is this, where it shows the four rings. And then the rails themselves are made up of uh, phosphates. This is a phosphate group. You see a P there for phosphorus, which is surrounded by uh, oxygens. But a couple of the oxygens are tied in with <coughs> other little rings here. These rings are, they're not nitrogen rings. You don't see any N there. Actually, you only see an oxygen here. And these are blank, which means that they are carbon. So these are carbon rings. Okay, and then the hydrogens, of course, are not shown. There will be hydrogens here to uh, complement the structure. Basically, you got carbon and hydrogen, therefore you got carbohydrates. And these are carbohydrates. Carbohydrates, another name for carbohydrates is sugars. And it has five corners, so this is a pentose. These are pentose sugars that form the rail of the ladder. Okay, the railings, the two railings, they are the same connected with uh, phosphate groups with uh, phosphorus. Uh, but all these pentose are the same. All these sugars are the same. There's no variety like the four bases. There's no variety. They're all the same uh, pentose sugar. Okay. Okay, okay. So that's called the backbone technically. The backbone is the railing and then the bases are in between which form, like I say, the steps or the rungs of the ladder. Questions, comments, no? All right, go back here. And you notice this ladder, of course, has been flattened out, but in nature, it will be spiral in what we call the double helix or the twisted ladder. Mm, what else about this? We can go forward. Let's look at compaction now. No questions, no? There's one more detail I haven't mentioned yet. I'll come back to it, which is anti-parallel. I'll get to that. But. Uh, I want you eventually to become familiar with these terms and become competent so that it shows that you know your stuff, you know the biochemistry of DNA, the basics, okay? So let's look at now compaction because we have to fit six feet into the nucleus of a microscopic cell <laughs> in each body, in each living thing. This is how compaction happens. It's essentially a twisting. Twisting, twisting, and twisting until you get tired of twisting and then you twist some more, okay? So the first level of twisting is the double helix. Right? <coughs> we established that, so that already gives it three-dimensionality. Because if you have a ladder flat, that's two-dimensional, but if you twist that ladder, now you have given it volume. All right, that is the basic structure, but that structure is actually too exposed. It's too exposed to mutagens to UV, to chemicals, to heat, so it can denature very easily. So a way to protect the DNA is to coil it upon itself, all right? So the second level of coiling beyond the double helix is to coil that double helix is to coil it upon itself with a nucleus, a, a, like a little, a little ball on which it's going to coil around, almost two times around, all right? And that little ball is made up of proteins. Eight proteins that are called histones. Histone proteins, they're very specific. And uh, it's actually four pairs. Mm -hmm. So there's histone two, three and four, two A, two B, three A, three B, four A, four B. And they form this little ball of eight little histone proteins. And then the DNA winds around it almost like a yo-yo, mm -hmm. and it winds almost two times around, 1.7 times. Don't worry about that detail, but it winds around this little ball to form what is really what we call the functional unit of DNA. The functional unit of DNA is called a nucleosome, all right? So you got chromosome and you got nucleosome. Nucleosome is the functional unit of DNA. So that is a stable DNA little package of information, if you will, is the actual double helix wound around almost two times around the uh, histone walls, all right? Then what happens? Those nucleosomes continue to wrap on top of each other in a coil fashion, and 
as they do, they continue to compact the DNA. All right, <coughs> continue to save the DNA, if you will, excuse me, in the smallest possible volume. And that is compaction. So we go into a coil of a coil of a coil, and that continues to coil upon itself into what we call the higher order structure of DNA, which is a supercoiling. And supercoiling is coiling upon coiling upon coiling of the DNA upon itself, all right? Of the DNA fiber. At this point, this is called the DNA fiber with the nucleosomes. And that eventually forms the actual chromosome or chromatin, even chromatin is supercoiled. So the information that is stored in here is really not very accessible because it's all bunched up inside the DNA. Okay? So that DNA molecule really is not very accessible. The base pairs where the code is, it's not really very accessible. It's shut down upon itself. And that's standard and that's normal and that's good <laughs> because that DNA information is precious. And if there's any damage, that's the original, okay? Every other DNA that will come from there will also be damaged or mis, uh, misinformed. So this supercoiling is standard, it's natural. Even chromatin is supercoiled. It's just that chromosomes are even more so condensed. It's the maximum possible condensation. And at that point, the chromatin actually splits into distinct little bodies. Now, it's all a very elaborate biochemical process, uh, mostly guided by proteins, sophisticated proteins and specific proteins that guide all this process to go on. We're gonna look now into two different types of process. One is how DNA duplicates itself which is called replication. And the other one is how DNA gets its information out of the nucleus, because the DNA is always staying in the nucleus. How the DNA gets the information out into the cytoplasm to eventually produce proteins, which is what the code is for. And that one is called trans, uh, transcription and translation. That's a two-step two -step process. Okay, so moving forward a little bit, this whole thing is about the compaction of DNA or the supercoiling. Uh, starting with the functional unit of the nucleosome and moving forward into the higher order structure, the DNA fiber, eventually into chromosomes, which is the maximum compaction possible. Uh, I wanna pick up uh, on something I left earlier that I mentioned, which is that the railings I mentioned are parallel, but more strictly speaking, they are really anti-parallel, so they maintain, uh, their parallel distance, but it's anti-parallel, meaning that there is a direction, there's an opposite direction. It's like uh, two lanes, two opposite lanes on a highway or something like that. You notice that, for example, on the lower railing here, we got T-A-C-T-C, -C, right? C-T-A-C-T-C, -C -C, right? We know what those, that's thymine, adenine, cytosine, thymine, uh, cytosine, okay. In the opposite, the pair, the pair, A, T, G, A, G, their complement, that's the complement pair, right? So T only pairs with A, but you notice that the A is facing in the opposite direction. That's what is meant by anti-parallel, is that when this DNA is read, it's actually read sequentially by a protein machinery that walks through it, that moves through it as if you, had uh, some kind of, remember the old, uh, <laughs> remember the, 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 even before the fax machine, that little tape that was punctured, what was that called? Mm, it's like a ticker tape, or oh, I forget the name of it now, but um, it's almost, it, it's a little tape that had holes in it, and you run that tape through a machine and it deciphers the little holes in the code, that's the beginning of all these uh, machines that we know today as computers, but it all started as a little tape that ran through a machine and it read the little the coding of the dots, of, of the, the little holes. Anyway, there's information and the information will go either from left to right or from right to left. So that if I'm reading the lower strand, all right, I have to read it 
from left to right in order for it to make sense. If I try to read it this way, it will not read the machinery is one way. The machinery will not go in the opposite direction. It has to be on the other lane to read in the opposite direction. So it's one way. Yeah, the machinery, it is. It's, it's actually, you know, you're going pictograms or ideograms, either from left to right or from right to left. Okay? And so that is what we call, in just a single word, anti-parallel. But the information is stored that way, in anti-parallel. But it's complementary. So if I give you one strand, and I can just represent the DNA just by the best pairing, I can say T, A, G, C, G, T, 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 T. And I give you that one strand, you can give me the complement of that strand because you know what the complement is from A to T and from C to G. But remember, it's going to be anti-parallel. So it has to be read at the end of the original strand backwards. Okay? Let's move forward. Okay, so I said that uh, the DNA will do one of two things. I will not do them at the same time. Either the DNA is duplicating or the DNA is metabolizing, if you will, maintaining the metabolism of the cell. When the cell is metabolizing, in what phase is the cell? Interface, interface, okay? And remember I said, most cells are in interface most of the time. In other words, they're, they're metabolizing. But periodically, when they get too large, what do they have to do? They have to duplicate, they have to uh, split into two. So at that stage, the cell will stop metabolizing basically, tone it down and go into reproductive mode, which is called the mitotic mode or mitosis for the cell. Or a special case when gametes are uh, produced, it's called meiosis, which is really like a double mitosis. <coughs> All right, so let's look at that duplication of DNA, which <coughs> I mentioned. Scientifically, it's called replication. So duplication is replication is uh, functionally similar to making a photocopy of the origin. I know this uh, diagram has a lot of detail. I just want you to understand the big picture, but to see what is actually happening on the cell. Here's a chromosome and here is a fiber chromatin fiber coming out of it, which is uncoiling. Eventually we get back down to the double helix. Okay, so we are hypothetically just um, in our minds, we are unwinding a little piece of the chromosome back out to the double helix stage. Okay, so here's the double helix and the four bases are shown in four different colors. Mm -hmm. They've even used straight lines for A and T in this little angle and they use curves for C and G, <laughs> all right? Now I told you there is a protein machinery that reads the DNA and that protein machinery is symbolized by this mustard colored blob here and down here, all right? And there's going to be a leading strand and there's going to be a lagging <coughs> strand, <coughs> but the machinery will only move one way. It will either move this way, as you can see on this lower strand, it's moving from left to right. And on the upper strand, the arrow is showing the synthesis or the replication of DNA is going, say, in the opposite direction from right to left. And this is the complementary strand of this original strand down here. All right, a strand is one half of the DNA. That's one strand is one half. So, <clears throat> This machinery has uh, several different functions. The first function is to open up the ladder, to unwind that DNA, or open up literally. It's called a helicase because it's open in the helix. It's open in the hole of the helix. Don't worry about those names. Just the big picture here is that in order to duplicate the DNA, it has to get uh, split open. That ladder has to get split open, has to get unwound totally and split open. But this only happens in a very narrow section where the replication is occurring, which is this region here. As soon as the complement is synthesized, we say synthesized, the new complement is synthesized, the helix naturally goes back to its uh, curvature, to its twist, 
because that's the natural, that's the more efficient way that those atoms, that those molecules are going to be. Energetically, those atoms have a three-dimensional, those, those molecules have a three-dimensional uh, posture to them, and they will naturally go back to the double helix. So the double helix is the least stressed. In fact, one way to unwind DNA, which we call denaturing DNA, is what? Is to heat it up, to provide an excess amount of energy to release the DNA coil. So under high heat, DNA becomes what we say denatured, becomes unwound. And then mutations can occur uh, relatively easily. Okay, but the natural state of the DNA molecule is that double helix. That's where energetically is, uh, is stable, more efficient, and in nature, that's, uh, its, um, that's its shape, natural shape. So you can see that that machinery, as soon as it has synthesized the new DNA, that DNA will naturally go back into the double helix, and the double helix will wind up around the, the proteins, the histone proteins, to form nucleosomes, and the nucleosomes will continue to uh, to rewind themselves up into the fiber, into the chromatin fiber, and so forth. So this machinery is in a very narrow range, very narrow area, and it's moving forward very fast, so fast that uh, it uh, suffers, fidelity suffers for that. It does it so fast in split second, precisely because the DNA is being exposed. And you only want to expose it in fractions of a second because that's where mutations can occur. And so the, the downside of that machinery moving so fast is that fidelity suffers. What I mean by fidelity is that sometimes there's a mismatch of the wrong base put in place and therefore it causes mutations. But then, guess this, this is so elegant that there's another machinery that comes on top of the new strand of DNA that has just been synthesized and corrects. So there is a repair mechanism that is natural that is a separate mechanism from the synthesis that comes afterwards, immediately afterward, through the DNA, the new DNA molecule, correcting most of the mistakes. So they reduce, let's say, from 99% to fidelity to 99.99% fidelity, okay? And I think the average rate of mutation is one in every 10,000 or something like that. Okay. Remember differently, let me know. But I think it's the, the mutation rate is about, on average, about <laughs> one in 10,000, which is a very, you know, it's 0.0001% or something. Okay, so this is what is known as the replication machinery. And the important thing about this is that DNA, when this machinery gets through this whole fiber, we have two identical strands of DNA, and therefore, the DNA has duplicated, all right? Has duplicated, and we call it replication. Is this happening at multiple points, though? Yes, so you have single points or multiple points, depending on pro, uh, prokaryotes or eukaryotes, okay? Uh, but uh, yes, and this will happen when the, when the cell goes into the cell cycle, into the mitotic stage. Well, just prior to that, the DNA is DNA synthesis, so that's the S phase on the cell, right? It, go, it duplicates. And then the cell will continue with the, uh, with the splitting process. Now, I mentioned that the DNA is within the nucleus, and the nucleus has these pores, these holes through the membrane, which is a double membrane, as can be seen there, just like the cell membrane is also a double membrane. But the DNA always stays inside the cell because it's precious, it's the original, and that DNA is not going to be exposed. Even in the cytoplasm, there are uh, chemicals that can damage it and other agents. So what the DNA does is uh, when, this, when the cell is not duplicating but metabolizing, okay, the DNA will make a single replicate of just one of the strands, and that is called uh, a transcription. And it will make a molecule that is similar to it, but it's a single strand, and it's called RNA. It's RNA. So DNA, when the DNA, when the cell is metabolizing, when the cell is not reproducing, not duplicating, just uh, information has to get out from the nucleus to tell the cytoplasm what to do, what work to do. The work is being done by proteins. 
but who makes the proteins? What is the code for the proteins? We have thousands of different proteins that work in our bodies. Where is the code for that? Well, the code is embedded in the DNA, but the DNA never leaves the nucleus. So there has to be a messenger that takes that code out into the cytoplasm to synthesize the proper proteins. That messenger is called messenger RNA, or just mRNA for short. And I mentioned to you briefly, and I'll show you the structure of RNA in a moment, but RNA is not as complex, if you will, as DNA because it's a single strand instead of double strand. See how here the double helix is represented, right? With two strands, RNA is a single strand. It's not a double helix, it's a single, single helix, if you will. That RNA will migrate out of the nucleus, again, with biochemical processes uh, chaperoning this, and the RNA migrates out through the pores into the cytoplasm. In the cytoplasm of the cell, outside the nucleus, there are some other structures that are called ribosomes. And these ribosomes are like miniature protein factories. These are protein factories. Okay? These ribosomes, they read the mRNA and translate it into a protein a particular protein, but the protein is also built by steps. Just like DNA, what is the basic molecule for DNA? Well, the bases, right, the nucleotides. So for the proteins, similar, the basic uh, molecules for proteins are called amino acids. And amino acids come together to form a chain, which is called a polypeptide, and then these chains also come together to form the more complex protein. So again, it's a level thing, similar to building a building. How do we start? Well, we start with building blocks, all right? The building blocks that are inside this wall, those are the amino acids. This wall could be considered like a, like a polypeptide, that's another polypeptide, and with four polypeptides, we'll make the full protein of the, of the womb itself, okay? Just analogous. To recap this process for a moment, like I said, uh, the, this one here is a two-step process. First is the replication. First is, uh, I'm sorry, the, the transcription. In other words, making the RNA from DNA to RNA. And the second step is from RNA to the actual protein. So two step, one is inside the nucleus, the other one is uh, on, in the cytoplasm. So the first step, as I said, is called transcription from DNA to RNA, specifically mRNA for messenger. A couple of things happen. One is that the base <coughs> thymine, the base thymine is substituted for uracil. And the other three bases stay the same. What are the other three bases? Adenine, guanine, and cytosine. Okay, but thymine, thymine <coughs> which is the pair of adenine, right? Thymine is substituted for uracil. They look very similar, actually. Let's uh, look at the chemical structure of, uh, let's see here. Uh, oops. Okay, so here is thymine. Remember, these are uh, carbons here carbon, 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 and then the hydrogens are not shown, they would complement. But uh, here's thymine, and here is uracil. It's just missing an extra carbon over here on the, on the left hand side. Okay. So, this is thymine is for DNA, and uracil is for RNA. So, that's the one difference. And the other difference is that RNA is a single strand, as you can see here, as opposed to a double strand. And so the U, wherever there was a T, see here, TA, the complement of A. So the, the bottom strand is the one that's being uh, transcribed. It's the bottom strand. 
here, T, A, C, T, A, etc. T is transcribed into A, but A is transcribed into U instead of T. Okay, so that makes this red strand RNA instead of DNA. And that's the transcription there. And this is the full transcript, it's called the transcript, which is the RNA equivalent of this DNA sequence here. All right. Okay, so that's the first half of transcription. Then this transcript, this mRNA, is the one that is sent outside the nucleus. So transcription occurs where? In the nucleus or in the cytoplasm? Transcription occurs in the nucleus, right? Because the DNA is protected, sending out its message. And then the next step, of course, will be translation from RNA to protein. And so this RNA transcript is then deciphered, deciphered into, translated into a polypep polypeptide chain, polypeptide chain, which is made up of amino acids, amino acids. And here we have uh, three amino acids indicated, methionine, uh, isoleucine, and serine. There are 20 amino acids in nature. We'll look at them in a minute. But since we are on protein synthesis, just to finish that little uh, discourse, I tell you that there are these uh, three levels of making the protein, right? Beginning with the amino acid sequence that you can see here. Each amino acid is showed in a different color. So this is known as the primary structure, not to worry, but it's just a sequence of amino acids. This sequence, again, just like the double helix, has a natural conformation that is stable, that is chemically stable, and which, guess what? It's again a twist, all right, a uh, helix, but it's a single helix, and it's normally called an alpha helix. Or another variety, instead of a helix, it is a uh, flat conformation, flat conformation of the polypeptide, which is called a sheet. And because the helix is already called alpha, then the sheet is called beta. So the intermediate structure, if you will, for protein, as proteins are being made, is either an alpha helix or a beta sheet. Then combinations of these alpha helices and beta sheets form what is known as the tertiary structure of protein, but typically functional proteins. The level of the actual function of the protein is a conglomerate of these intermediate structures, what is known as the tertiary structure. They're combined together to form finally what is known as the quaternary structure and this is really the functional protein in nature. I'll give you an example. Hemoglobin, all right? What is the hemoglobin? Where is hemoglobin found? In the blood, in the RBC, in the red blood cells, okay? And hemoglobin is the one that carries oxygen from the lungs to every tissue of the body and from the tissues back out to the lung, instead of carrying oxygen, it carries CO2 as a byproduct of metabolism, we've got to get rid of the CO2, right? We exhale CO2, okay. So hemoglobin as such is a quaternary structure like this. It's a functional protein, but it's made up of subunits. In fact, hemoglobin is made up of four subunits. Each one of them is called myoglobin, all right? So hemoglobin is made up of four myoglobin uh, units and uh, they're actually shown here in uh, this yellow, red, green, and blue. So each one of these could be a myoglobin structure, which when combined together, now they form finally the functional protein. Okay, so it's pretty elaborate. It's like a car is made up of different parts. If I just lay out the motor, the tires, the seat, the chassis, and every other part of the car laid out here, it's not gonna work. I have all the parts of the car, but they're not assembled functionally. They have to be in that final of, uh, structure, functional structure, for them to do their, their work. And like I mentioned, thousands of proteins, and they are essentially the ones that do the work in the body. Okay, 
For example, enzymes are proteins that involve in digestion. Also structurally, they form the, the structure of the cell, okay, that gives um, uh, the, the scaffolding necessary for uh, metabolism to occur. So we've gone a bit into uh, the protein structure and how they're formed. The code of the protein, you see how the code comes originally from the nucleus without the nucleus ever leaving, I'm sorry, with the DNA ever leaving the nucleus. It can direct what's happening out there in the cytoplasm by sending this messenger RNA. To recap, look at the um, DNA, from DNA to RNA, from RNA to protein. The two step, the first step is transcription, the second step is translation. So what do we call RNA to protein? What do we call that? RNA to protein? Translation. And RNA, uh, DNA to RNA? Transcription. How about DNA to protein? Not directly, doesn't exist, okay? However, this is so basic to life, as we know it organically speaking, because proteins are the ones, DNA has the code, uh, the information, and the protein do the work, all right? So this is so basic to nature and how nature functions universally that it's called the central dogma of biology. This is the central dogma of biology, just like the Blessed Trinity is the central dogma of Christianity, <laughs> all right? If you want to look at parallels to the physical and the metaphysical. Would you like another parallel? Sorry? Yeah. Would you like another parallel in my favor? Yes. Why not? 46 chromosomes, right? 46, yes. How many books in the Old Testament? Oh, yeah. 46, 46. exactly. That's yeah. the origin, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly, yeah. It all comes out from there. Very good. That's a good way to remember it. To remember both numbers, right? <laughs> for scientists to remember the Bible and for theologians to remember the, the chromosomes to, to remember Darwin. <laughs> okay. Thank you. All right. Moving forward then. This is a summary. The cell is either, the DNA is either in replication mode when the cell is reproducing or the cell is either, uh, the DNA is either in, in uh, transcription or translation when the cell is metabolizing, okay? And these are mutually exclusive because precisely uh, reproduction <coughs> takes all the effort of the cell to do that, it takes all the effort. Questions, comments, no? Okay, we need to go uh, one step further, a couple of steps, maybe we may be able to actually look at mitosis in a little bit of detail. But what I want to present to you now is the genetic code, which this is what uh, Watson and Crick deciphered. <coughs> Initially, well, it was uh, first the DNA structure in the 50s, 1953, got the Nobel Prize, and then in the 60s, the actual genetic code was also deciphered. So this is the core of the genetic code. Again, universal, it applies for um, all living species that have uh, uh, DNA as their basis. What do we have? We have what is known as a triplet code. In other words, every three bases, three consecutive bases form a triplet. It's also known as a codon. That's what put in here. This is fixed in here. Oops. Sometimes you run across this word, the codon. So the triplet code. So these are codons, all right? There we go. So how many letters in a triplet? How many letters in a codon? Three. So you get the first letter, you get the second letter, and you get the third letter. Going around here, right? So let's say the first letter is a U. So is this DNA or RNA? Um, this is the RNA, RNA equivalent. We could translate this into DNA. We would put here what? If this were, it would be a T instead of a U, right? So it would be T, 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 etc. 
All right. So, but this is the RNA transcript. At any rate, the first letter is a U. And let's say the second letter is also a U, and the third letter in that particular triplet is also a U. I'm just using, choosing the first three letters that appear in each one. U, U, and U, okay? So that's this one here. That's that triplet, U, U, U. That codes for DHE, this particular amino acid, it's uh, phenylalanine. That's just the, uh, the three-letter uh, abbreviation, thank you, of the amino acids, okay? But if I have U, U, A, all right, if the third letter is A here, then I got this triplet, U, U, A. U, U, A does not code for phenylalanine. It codes for leucine, which is a different amino acid. There's a total of 20 amino acids. If you sum all these, all right, there's a total of 20 amino acids that occur in nature. Let's look at some amino acids here. Well, I can look at the 20 amino acids. Just for chemical structures, I don't know who is responsible for the chemical structures of the chemical. I should have been at the bachelor level, and that's what John and Michaela and Andrea you do with your students, right? Maybe? No? no? <laughs> okay, you have to know them at least once to pass the test. Then for the rest of the years, they can look at their phone. <laughs> but these are the 20 amino acids here. They're divided into four categories, the ones that are polar, the ones that are nonpolar, the ones that are positive, and the ones that are negative and into their charges and so forth. But this is a chemical structure. As you can see, it's a variety of structures. Some are rings, some are chains, mm -hmm. some are single. Alanine is the smallest one. It's just CH3, one carbon and three hydrogens. Mm -hmm. Some are, are pretty complex, like this double ring here, tryptophan. But these are the 20 amino acids that occur in nature, naturally, these are organic molecules. Remember we talked about the Urey Miller experiment? All right, they simulated uh, the, uh, the, um, the primitive uh, atmosphere with methane and ammonia and you know, hydrogen and uh, water vapor with some kind of a uh, shock. Uh, then they got some of these amino acids as a product of that. So they went from inorganic uh, molecules to organic. These are all organic molecules because they have carbon and they have hydrogen. We'll review this a little more in detail when we get to the environmental course, but basically these are the bases, the building blocks for proteins. Building blocks for proteins and proteins are the ones that do the work in metabolism. So this is really at the molecular level. This is another aspect of the beginning of life, organically speaking, that a cell be alive. Okay, so back to the genetic code, these 20 little abbreviations, they all abbreviate these uh, amino acids. So that triplet code codes for a specific amino acid. But you see that there's another 64 here. <laughs> well, this is actually 46, 64, this is uh, the reverse. If we, um, if we add, all the possible combinations of triplet codes. How many triplet codes can we get? All right. It's uh, because the four bases, uh, three, so it's four to the cube, right? Four times four is 16, and 16 times four, 64. Okay, so we have four bases, and it's any combination of those four bases, any possible combinations, that's a total of 64 possible combinations. It's four to the cube, okay? And four to the cube is 64. So if we count the triplets in here, if we count the triplets, how many triplets would we find? We would find 64 triplets. For example, how many triplets in this square? There are four triplets, right? And how many squares are across the top? Four, and across uh, the bottom, Four, so four times four is 16, times four, or gives you 64, all right? 
Okay, so we got 64 triplet combinations, but we only have 20 amino acids. And so there is duplication or repetition. In other words, you see that two different triplets code for the same amino acids. UUU and UUC code for phenylalanine. But over here, actually four, the four triplets, UC, U, UCC, UCA, and UCG, they all code for serine or another amino acid. Okay, so there's like repetition. This kind of repetition is called redundancy. There is redundancy in the genetic code. So that several different triplets code for the same amino acid. Some are two, some are three, some are four. Okay. So for example, again, phenylalanine is two, uh, one with three, uh, ILE, isoleucine, that is three triplets, code for isoleucine. Four triplets, code for tyrosine, proline, serine, arginine, uh, glycine, etc. Okay, alanine. But you notice there are only two amino acids that code for one triplet. Okay. AUG codes for uh, methionine and UGG codes for tryptophan, okay, only. So UGG only calls for tryptophan and AUG only calls for uh, methionine. So this is actually known as a start codon, methionine. So AUG when the machinery that is making the protein sees AUG triplet, it starts reading from there forward, from there downstream. Because before that, it's nonsense. It doesn't code for any amino acid, okay? But the triplet, when there's AUG in a, excuse me, in a sequence, that tells the machinery that's the beginning of a protein sequence. <laughs> that's the very beginning. So this is known as a start codon. And then, this one, UAG, is the stop coda. And again, it's a single. So when that same machinery gets to a UAG, it drops off. <laughs> the machinery stops. Okay? And that's the stop coda. So it doesn't code for any particular amino acid, but it stops the, uh, the translation. of the, It stops that polypeptide. And then the machine will continue and we'll find another AUG and start a new polypeptide. And that's how the polypeptides are made sequentially. And then those polypeptides are folded into each other to make the tertiary structure. And then those subunits come together to form finally mm -hmm. the functional protein known as the quaternary structure. Okay. But this is the basis. This is the core of the code right here, the genetic can, code. Can you change this code? Um, can this code be changed in fact? Can you change this? How so? What would you change in it? No, I'm not saying what Starting with the same basis, with the four bases? Yeah. Yes. In fact, there are analogs to these bases which are made in the lab artificially, okay, but are somewhat modified because what happens with molecules typically, not the whole molecule is informative. In other words, there's a part of the molecule that is typically known as the active site. That's the part that has the information, but there's another part of the molecule that may not be an active site. So you can change either the non-active site or the active site, and you're actually changing the function of that molecule, all right? Because it will code for something else. And that's how mutation occurs sometimes, is by changing the, the active site or the functional site of the molecule into something similar, but not exactly. And so the code will come out somewhat differently. So there can be change on any level here, yes. And those typically translate into mutations. Now, the good thing about the, is that most mutations are neutral. They don't have really a deleterious effect because of that DNA of those six feet, if we go back to that six feet fiber, bless you, uh, only about 3% has really coding region in it, has information, has the, the, a code that codes for something, only 3%. The other 97% doesn't really code for a functional protein. Tradition has been called junk DNA. When you hear that term junk DNA, we'll get into it more, but basically junk DNA doesn't have coding regions, doesn't have triplets, okay? 
It may have another function at the higher level. We believe that possibly that that's my second PhD was on that, on the higher order structure of the DNA. If, if that other 97% of the DNA has some function. But it's also, it's like a cesspool of uh, viral, viral fragments, basically. Okay, remnants of viruses probably that have been incorporated over the millennia into the species DNA. We're not unique on it, you know, that's pretty much the standard. Only about 3% of the DNA, whatever species actually codes for something, codes for a protein. So you can think that there may be a lot of waste there, but it's really just not used. It's coiled in there and it's, there's no information. What do you call that? Junk DNA, it's been called junk DNA uh, um, as far as coding is concerned, but it may have another function typically in the, in the winding in the higher order structure of the DNA, which then would not make it junk, but actually valuable. <laughs> okay. But as far as coding, junk DNA, 97% of that hope uh, six feet. All right, so you see redundancy. Also, there's another thing called wobble, since I have a couple minutes. <laughs> uh, the, the wobble is the third base. So when I mention a triplet, what am I talking about? Triplet code, also known as a codon. It's just three, base, three bases in a sequence, three sequential bases. You choose whatever. You have 64 possibilities, right? Okay, so that's the triplet code. The third one, the third base, the third base is called a wobble because it can be changed uh, generally without changing the code. So for example, again, going back to this uh, phenylalanine, UUU or UUC, doesn't matter whether if the third base is a U or a C, it still, it still calls for phenylalanine, all right? The same with uh, leucine, the same thing. The third base could be either adenine or guanine, A or G, it still calls for leucine. Any one of them. Look at proline for all four. The third base can be any one of the four bases. Right, see, on the triplet, U, C, A, G, doesn't matter, it still calls for proline, proline for that amino acid, all right? So it's the first two then that- really It's the first two really that have most of the code. The third one has to be, it could be something because, yeah. you know, uh, there's a difference between proline and uh, leucine or serine, but many of them actually take four, all four, you see? So for example, uh, leucine, serine, proline, uh, thyrosine, alanine, valine, these are glycine, arginine, these all take any, any triplet on the fourth, uh, on the, any base on the third position. That is called wobble. They call that wobble, okay? Uh, so there's redundancy in the code in that 64 uh, triplets code for only 20 amino acids, and there's also wobble <coughs> on the third base in, in, the code, in each coda. Those are characteristics, that's uh, genetic uh, lingo, if you will. But at least you heard it once, so that uh, you're not thrown off base when you hear these terms. Okay, I think that now you are ready to understand DNA and RNA in its full extension of the word, because even the press, media, talks about DNA, right? Do they have a clue? Can they spell it out? <laughs> All right, so if we spell out the acronym, deoxyribonucleic acid, that's a mouthful. <laughs> deoxyribonucleic acid, it's actually just two words. So deoxyribonucleic acid, <laughs> All right? So here's where the acronym comes from. The D comes from deoxy, deoxy. The uh, N comes, uh, actually the D comes from deoxyribo. The N comes from nucleic, and the A comes from acid. All right, so deoxyribonucleic acid, DNA. And it's the double helix. Whereas RNA is only ribonucleic acid. Hmm. 
impurity instead of a Okay, so ribonucleic acid is RNA. And that makes the difference between a double helix or a single helix. Okay. And also the difference between thymine and uh, uracil. Yes. So now you know the full extent of the word and just for the sake of completing this little detail. So we got, remember how I told you that the rung, the, the rails of the ladder are made up by these sugars, it's pentoses, all right? Those are the riboses. Mm -hmm. And whether they are uh, deoxygenated or single oxygenated, that makes a difference between DNA and RNA at the molecular level, at the atomic level. So we could just briefly take a look at that on the structure that I have on. Okay, well, okay, so this is the uh, pentose of the ribose and whether it's uh, uh, oxygenated or deoxygenated will make a difference between DNA or RNA. It's kind of a technical thing. But when it's RNA, it's a single strand. However, that single strand by itself, just like that, is not really stable because our intuition tells us that uh, G will pair up with C and uh, A will pair up with U here. So it actually coils upon itself and it's called hairpinning. It hairpins into itself, naturally, functionally, the RNA. But it's also much less stable than DNA. DNA is a much more stable molecule than RNA. So RNA is very susceptible to mutations or to degradation, to breaking down, precisely because it doesn't have the complementary region. So it coils upon itself, uh, hairpins upon itself, and sometimes uh, there's mismatch that gets caught up into that hair pinning. Okay, questions, comments? No, took all good. You see where the terms come from now. So, kind of uh, reviewing, we looked at mostly the one mode of reproduction, a sexual reproduction, okay? and the different types, I've given you examples here. Uh, but one thing that remains constant in, sexual, in uh, asexual reproduction is that the number of chromosomes remains the same, what we call a diploid cell. The diploid cell has a full complement of chromosomes, has the paired number. For us, it will be 23 pairs, okay? So, the common aspect of all these different types of asexual reproduction is that the number of chromosomes stays the same, and that's why it's called mitosis. In order for it to stay the same, duplication has to happen before the actual split. A duplication, what do we call that duplication in nature, scientifically? Replication. Okay, uh, whereas the other mode uh, uh, for DNA to get the information out, that's the transcription translation. Okay. You can review this at home over the days as you're doing your summary, but become familiar with the main um, names, the main words, significant, for example, so the central dogma, you know that it involves from DNA to RNA as the intermediate and the RNA to is then translated into the functional proteins of the cell. Now, in a few minutes, uh, we can look at mitosis for a moment, just to complete this picture, mitosis at the uh, genetic level, or at the chromosome level. And this will be the final part of this uh, lecture. What do we have in mitosis? So in mitosis, each cell splits individually, one at a time, into two cells, 
So we go from one mother cell to two daughter cells. Those are just the terms that are used. Mitosis involves a simple split of each cell from the mother cell, which typically has overgrown its size, into two daughter cells. Okay? And that's the process of mitosis. And we say that it maintains the diploid number of chromosomes. Diploid, the prefix di, is a reference to two, to double, right? So the diploid number of chromosomes, which is indicated as 2n. The two is a reference to the diploid, and the n is simply a reference to n, to number, number. So in the human, what is n, just by itself? In the human, n is 23. And two times 23, this is just very simple little algebra. Okay, the coefficient, two times 23 is the 46. So we humans, at the genetic level, we have either 46 chromosomes or 23 pairs. Okay, but n just indicates number, and each species has an n number. All right? Close to us, I've mentioned chimpanzee many times, troglodytes, they have, their n is 24. <laughs> actually have one more chromosome than us. And so their 2n, their diploid number is what? 24 times 2, 48. Okay, straightforward. All right, now the fact that they have an extra chromosome more, more than us doesn't make them more intelligent than us necessarily. There's a worm actually that has uh, 200n. <laughs> okay. Doesn't rice have lottery? Yes, polyploid, yes, yes. and. Uh, and apples, that's another phenomenon that is called tetraploid or polyploid, where instead of two, it's four, four N. Many fruits have are four N. They're tetraploid, they're double the double, and that's how they come that large. Typically doubling the number of chromosomes, what it does overall, generally, is it increases the overall size because the whole information is there, all of the information is there, double, <laughs> double again and so it increases size. So many fruits are tetraploid, you know, the fruit trees that, that are grown in agriculture today. All right, so the interesting here is that diploidy is maintained, the, the, the diploid number. I'm emphasizing this because the alternative process to mitosis is called meiosis, and that's the formation of gametes, which we'll go into uh, next Friday. And the formation of gametes, the cells that result, the daughter cells that result, are actually n. They're not 2n, they're 1n. And when there's a coefficient of 1, typically it's not shown. So you just see n, that means 23, unpaired. So our eggs and our sperm only have 23 chromosomes each. That's essential, that's important, so that when fertilization occurs, the diploidy is restored, the 2n is restored because if sperm was 2n and, sper and, and egg was 2n, when they meet, well, that's actually polyploid, right? That would make a 4n embryo. <laughs> and that embryo is going to code for double of everything, different from what it happens in plants. In animals, it would be two heads, four arms, four legs, double of everything. Okay, so that was super abnormal and it doesn't occur. And that's the, the, really the key of sexual reproduction, which we'll get into next uh, uh, Friday, is there is a chromatic reduction. There is a reduction of the number of chromosomes. It gets rid of the pairs, if you will. And the way to doing that simply is by duplicating the process and so that uh, the, result, the end result of one cell, instead of two, it comes out four cells. So for every precursor cell, four eggs are actually generated or actually the polar bodies they get reabsorbed, it's easier for the sperm. Four sperm cells are, are generated, but each sperm has only N number instead of 2N. I'm kind of anticipating uh, next lecture, it's hard for me to <laughs> stay on track. Uh, but this is for now the simple process of mitosis, of mitosis. We start with cell in interphase, okay? The cell in interphase, the DNA is in what form, in what shape, in what structure? In chromatin, which is that long, wide, spaghetti-like, right? Inside the bowl, which we call the nucleus. 
Now the, the, this cell is going to go into cell division. Therefore, metabolism shuts down virtually uh, to a minimum, essentially just the duplication process, which is called replication. And it's also called DNA synthesis. And so you see that here, the chromosomes have already duplicated in this first stage of mitosis called prophase. The chromosomes are duplicated because each one of the chromosomes has two legs. And actually the two legs are tied in the middle by a little region called the centromere. Don't worry about those details. But basically, I want you to see uh, two chromosome pairs here, okay? Chromosome pairs. And so how many chromosome pairs are in this cell? Four, Four chromosome pairs. Uh, so what, uh, uh, and how many total number of chromosomes? Four times 46. No, four times two. So, okay, so it will be eight. Eight chromosomes, four pairs of chromosomes here. Four pairs of chromosomes. Four pairs, total, see? That's why we have to do that mental flip because be single double, all right? So 46 or 26, 23 pairs. Well, this would be four pairs. So um, what, is the, what is the N number of this cell? What is the, this little N, what is the number for that N? What is the value? Four, exactly, four, A, B, C, D. These are chromosomes, A, B, C, D. So the value for this N is four. And therefore, in its diploid form, it's two N, right? Which is a grand total of eight chromosomes, or four pairs. The next stage, now this is all the, the mitosis, and basically four, four large uh, steps, if you will, all right? The first step is the prophase. What you notice here, the difference is that the chromatin has become distinct bodies called chromosomes. Okay. Your original question. This is by an elaborate biochemical mechanism, but it happens. Simultaneously, you notice that this, the nuclear membrane represented here as a thin blue uh, circle, right? That nuclear membrane has dissolved away. Okay. And so the next stage is that these chromosome pairs line up at what we call the equator of the cell. The equator of the cell, which is the central region. These chromosomes line up like that. And you have to imagine this as a, as a sphere, as a three-dimensional volume. They line up pretty much at the center. And these little fibers are synthesized. Guess what these fibers are made up of? proteins, right? They're going to do the work. Yeah. And the work that they're going to do is they're going to pull the chromosomes in opposite directions so that the centromere splits. Okay? It, 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 isn't it the elegant? It really is. All this by biochemical enzymes, by, by proteins, by it's a molecular machinery that works on its own every time for millennia has been happening like this on and on and on and on by itself without us wanting it or knowing it and lately we have become aware of it <laughs> so they split and they're being pulled by these uh, fibers into the opposite poles okay in the meantime the cell starts pinching in the middle and eventually and so that's called anaphase the third stage Phase How many and finally, that? sorry, that's eight. It now becomes eight. Yeah, so the the two end the diploidy is maintained. Why is diploidy maintained? Because of what happened here, which is not really indicated. What happened between here and here to the chromosomes? The chromosomes duplicated, mm -hmm. so replication went on. Yeah. Okay, it's not. It's not in detail here. It's just showing the chromosome pairs. But duplication had gone on here so that when these split, each uh, final cell, each nucleus, has this uh, 
So yeah, these chromosomes, these are chromosome pairs. They should be indicated as chromosome pairs. <coughs> but the important thing in mitosis is that the, the deployed, the, the 2N number is maintained because beforehand there was a duplication of the chromosomes. So there was an intermediate stage here, precisely at prophase, that we can say that this cell momentarily was 4N, 4N. Okay, because when this split happens, chromosome pairs migrate to uh, the opposite pole. So there was temporarily, this cell was 4N because the duplication happened, a replication happened. All right, finally, the fourth stage is called telophase. Telo is the end or the, the finish line. Uh, telos is the final of the end. And then the nuclear membrane resynthesizes again by proteins or other macromolecules so that we have two distinct nuclei. The cell continues to pinch in the middle and eventually is split up. Okay. This splitting is called cytokinesis. Cytokinesis is the splitting of the, of the uh, cytoplasm itself whereas the splitting of the nucleus is called karyokinesis. Too technical, don't have to worry about it. But the important thing in mitosis, the overall big message is that the original cell, which was diploid to N, the two resulting daughter cells maintain their diploidy, they are still to N. Because in between, early on, there was a duplication of the chromosomes so that momentarily this was 4N, okay? And that duplication process we know is called replication. The entire DNA sequence, the entire chromatin is duplicated. Okay, you have endured a lot of <laughs> biology, biochemistry, <laughs> and molecular biology and genetics. <laughs> Any questions or comments? Mm -hmm. Again, I'll send you this uh, PowerPoint and I'll send you also the link to this lecture. Uh, remember, it's missing all the instructions that I gave originally, but basically just to summarize, and so I get it, hopefully, I've been recording this. Let me just check that I've become neurotic. Oh, yes, good. When I see pause recording, it means that it's recorded. Okay. <laughs> so, to recap what didn't get uh, recorded at the very beginning, um, if you still have uh, Meyer's book on evolution, please return it back to me. Uh, also, with regards to uh, look at your emails. Uh, I'm saying this for the benefit of uh, the students who didn't make it today. Um, try to look at your STU email at least at the beginning of the day, at the end of the day, because um, it's important. I know you get a lot of uh, junk email, talk about junk DNA, but on the subject, if you see on the subject, MS Bioethics, it's my email to you, so please open it and read it, okay? Uh, what else did I have at the beginning? Uh, the summaries, okay, uh, summaries are good. Use the narrow margin of half inch. Try to keep it within uh, two to four pages, uh, meaning one to two sheets. And finally, the internship, I send you already an email with uh, the internship uh, with the syllabus of the course, so you can read that. And also I send you the, uh, uh, the Excel spreadsheet with the two columns of the date and the time. And I send you also the form that I would eventually send to the supervisor once you give me the name and the email of that person. So you can look at that in the coming weeks. Okay, questions, John? Yeah. Andrea, either one, wanna flip? <laughs> okay, yeah, we can take a look at that in a minute as soon as we close this down. Yeah. For the, for the internship, yeah. how would um, we incorporate maybe like a genetics or a pharmaceutical company if we want to? Do yeah, if you have uh, some contacts or some leads and so forth, follow up on those and you can land it on your own. If uh, you're having difficulty landing something in that area, let me know and I'll try to do whatever I can with some of the resources that I have, okay? And also medical doctors in town also, uh, an internship with an MD. Sometimes it's a little more difficult, what they call shadowing, 
uh, but this is typically reserved for medical students, for students who are going into uh, medicine. That's an email from one of my students, the MD, maybe her ears are ringing. <laughs> one of the MD, she actually works for, uh, um, for Baptist system. So uh, we'll try to accommodate it the best possible. So try to get the interests of your own. If you have difficulty, let me know, and I'll look at my resources. Okay. So it's like an ethics department email that? Yeah, all, all they do, they have ethics, they have uh, all the systems that are involving healthcare, even if it's just for compliance purposes, okay, for the sake of meeting the regulations of government, of legal things, they have to have some kind of ethics board or ethics uh, committees or sometimes they're called institutional review boards also where they're in a in an institution like academics hmm? okay. okay anything else all right super thanks again and i'll see you saturday. next uh, saturday now i'm starting at 9 15 i started a little later today but if there's no one in here i'll start at 9 15 and you can watch the video okay because the alternative is that we run later than 12 45 and I'm sure no one is happy with that. So as long as I start at 9.15, I'm good with ending at uh, 12.45. In fact, we ended up a little earlier today. Okay. Are you right. sending us the syllabus so I know what Saturday is uh, Oh, yes. I need to send you the syllabus for this course, actually. Yes, uh, so we know yes. what Saturday is. For, so. for the two courses, I'll for send you. Courses. Yeah, which has the calendar in yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Okay. Thanks again. Have a great Sounds week. Right. All right. Many blessings. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot. I'll send you the stuff. Okay.